Buenas tardes. Saludos a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Cristobal. I am here with my colleague Pau. We are part of Colectivo Babilla. Estoy aquí con mi colega Pau. Somos parte del Colectivo Babilla. And we will be providing simultaneous interpretation for today's event. Vamos a estar proveyendo interpretación simultánea del inglés al español y del español al inglés para el evento de hoy. So I'm going to share in both languages some brief instructions on how to activate the Zoom interpretation feature. These instructions you can also see um, right now on the screen in the slide presented. Um, in a second, uh, interpretation is now active. So you will see an interpretation globe icon that says interpretation. Once you click on that, you can select the language of your preference and you will be listening to the simultaneous live interpretation of whatever is being spoken in the main room. En algunos segundos, ya la interpretación está activada y vas a poder ver un icono de globo que dice interpretación y podrás escoger el canal con el lenguaje preferido para entonces escuchar la interpretación en vivo y simultánea del lenguaje que se esté hablando en el cuarto principal. If you select English and Spanish is being spoken in the main room, you will listen to the English interpretation and the other way around. Si seleccionas español y se habla inglés en el cuarto principal, estarás escuchando la interpretación al español y viceversa. Since we are interpreting live, we do our best work if we, by asking folks to speak at a moderate pace, we know that it's, we are dealing with very exciting topics and sometimes when we read, we go faster. So we do ask you to consider the interpreters and speak at a moderate pace. Hacemos nuestro mejor trabajo como intérpretes si le pedimos al exponente que hablen a un paso moderado. Sabemos que son temas emocionantes y a veces si leemos vamos muy rápido, así que les pedimos que por favor consideren a la interpretación y hablen un poco más despacio. Um, we also ask that if you're switching languages to please do so after a brief pause. Si van a cambiar de lenguaje porque son bilingües, por favor, háganlo luego de una breve pausa. And um, if you have any issues with interpretation, uh, please message me, Cristóbal, or Pau. We have interpreter in our name and we can help you troubleshoot any issues. Si tienen problemas con la interpretación en algún momento, puedes enviar mi mensaje a mí, Cristóbal, o a Pau. Tenemos intérprete en nuestro nombre. Y podemos ayudarte con cualquier problema técnico. Thank you very much and have a great event. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Cristobal. Hello, my name is Michelle Ruiz. I use the pronoun she, her, ella, and I am the program coordinator at the US Latinx Art Forum. As we begin this event, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and honor our ancestral grounds and support indigenous peoples ongoing stewardship and struggles to protect their cultural resources and homelands. I'm currently broadcasting from my home in Berwyn, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa and Potawatomi tribes. The U.S. Latinx Art Forum champions artists and arts professionals through initiatives that advance the vitality of Latinx art and foster an intergenerational network that spans academia, art institutions, and collections. In 2021, we partnered with the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the New York Foundation for the Arts to administer the Latinx Artist Fellowship. This fellowship awards $50,000 in unrestricted funds to each member of a multicultural, of a multi-generational cohort of 15 visual artists each year for an initial commitment of five years. It is our first significant prize of its kind and celebrates the plurality and diversity of Latinx artists and aesthetics. It is designed to address the systemic and long-standing lack of philanthropic and institutional support for Latinx artists, and we are honored to be a partner for this groundbreaking initiative. It is my pleasure to welcome you to X as Intersection, Shaping Worlds. We are thrilled that you have joined us. Today's event marks the start of our 2023-2024 Access Intersection series, which gathers our third cohort of fellows into conversation with curators and USLAF members who share a sustained commitment to Latinx art. We plan to close our event with a Q&A facilitated by our moderators, and we invite you to submit your questions using the Q&A function below. 
It is my pleasure to introduce our co-hosts for this conversation, Marcela Guerrero, the Martini Family Curator of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City, and Mary Thomas, Director of Programs at the U.S. Latinx Art Forum. Thank you, Michelle. Hola a todos. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Marcela Guerrero and I use pronouns she, her, ella. I want to acknowledge that the Whitney Museum is located on the lands of the Lenape people. As a result of centuries of colonialism, today the Lenape are, are dispersed throughout the US and Canada. Alongside the Lenape, many other indigenous nations have ancestral ties to this place now known as New York including the six Haudenosaunee nations, Seneca, Cayuga, Tuscarora, Mohawk, Oneida, and Onondaga, as well as the Shinnecook and Puspatak. We honor their ongoing connection to this place. To those joining us online, please take a moment to identify and recognize the indigenous people who have always and continue to steward the land from where you're joining us. Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Thomas, and my pronouns are she, her, Aya. It is such a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. I am speaking with you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is sacred land that has been stewarded by the Dakota Oyate for millennia and was unfairly ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. Marcella and I would like to welcome you all to Shaping Worlds, the first of four virtual panels in this third year of the X as Intersection public lecture series. These panels are a great opportunity to tease out the common threads found among this year's cohort of the Latinx Artist Fellowship and an excellent way to learn more about key issues in contemporary Latinx art. It fills us with tremendous joy and pride to be in fellowship with today's audience and the artists with whom we'll be in conversation. Margarita Cabrera, Beatriz Cortez, and the Artist Collective Post Commodity. The artists we'll speak with today create work that spans years long collaborations, speculative histories, and the recuperation of indigenous worldviews. Their work is complex, drawing upon layered histories and contexts that encourages close attention and invites close engagement. In other words, they each deserve an art artist talk, but for today, we have invited them to share a window into their engagement with constructed and natural environments. In today's conversation, we will explore the ways contemporary sculpture can critique political forces at play in society and how the process of shaping worlds is one of co-creation that takes place alongside communities, ancestors, and the environment we reside within. I will now turn it over to Marcella to introduce our panelists this afternoon. I will read a brief introduction on each artist, but please check out their websites or follow them on their social media channels. Margarita Cabrera was born in Monterrey, Mexico and moved to El Paso, Texas at the age of 10. Her work centers around socio-political community issues, including cultural identity, migration, violence, inclusivity, labor, and empowerment. Cabrera creates sculptures made out of mediums ranging from steel, copper, wood, ceramics and fibers, and often employs a collaborative process that references the rich traditions of indigenous Mexican textiles and pays homage to the collective labor of women. Beatriz Cortez was born in San Salvador, El Salvador, and lives and works in Los Angeles. Cortez's work explores simultaneity, life in different temporalities and different versions of modernity, particularly in relation to memory and loss in the aftermath of war and the experience of migration and in relation to imagining po possible futures. Post Commodity is an interdisciplinary art collective comprised of Cristobal Martinez, Genisaro Manto Chicano, and Kate L. Twist, Cherokee. Post Commodity's indigenous lens and voice forge new metaphors capable of rationalizing our shared experiences 
within this increasingly challenging contemporary environment, promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social, political, and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies, and connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with a broader pub public sphere. To fully understand the rich practice of each of these artists would require hours of conversation and close observation of their works. Instead, the purpose of today's panel is to look at one specific angle of their practice and to spark the interest in you to learn more. We encourage questions, provocations, and any other way in which you want to express generosity toward the artists or the themes here discussed. While the ideas articulated this evening will undoubtedly be personal and profound, we welcome a casual atmosphere where curiosity prevails. With that said, I will hand it over to Mary. She and I will post questions to each of the artists and afterwards the artists will have about 10 minutes to be in conversation with each other and with us, the moderators. We have devised this segment of the panel as an opportunity for the artists to be in, and I quote, community of interest, activity, feeling or experience, the true definition of a fellowship and to explore the points of contact between them. We have reserved five to 10 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the talk. You don't have to wait until the last minute and let us know if you have any technical difficulties, we will do our best to help you. And now I'll invite Mary and Margarita to join. Thank you, Marcela. Margarita, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you this afternoon. And to start, I'd like to ask you, as an artist who engages in long-term collaborations and the co-creation of artworks within a landscape that has been scarred by the imposition of borders and resulting histories of violence and repression, how do you give form to the stories embedded within the land and that belong to the communities who reside there. Hello, everybody. Can you see me? I can see you. Okay, hi there. Saludos, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here in conversation with everyone today. Um, I want to thank the Latinx artist fellows for this wonderful opportunity. So how do I give form to stories embedded in the land? Um, as a community artist, my goal has always been to give shapes to new forms using various materials and technologies and to consider the community as a main medium of this process. So shaping relationships and new ways of seeing and new ways of being. Um, the community projects are usually in three parts, the storytelling and the workshops, and then come the exhibitions and the cultural dialogues and community presentations. So the shaping and the forming begins with the ideation and the inception of conversations and strategizing with partners and community leaders, um, getting all the approvals for design, for engineer, construction plans, etc. Um, and then come the shaping of community relations, forming a sense of commitment, a sense of trust um, that can lead to um, a good environment for story sharing. And uh, then we give form to symbols that represent the stories that are shared by the participants. So after the story sharing and after the, the creation of symbols, we move on to the construction of the actual physical works. And then I, at that point, take the role of the artist educator and I'm um, leading um, a group of people, um, usually um, folks that are making art for the first time. So it's, um, I put the role of the artist educator, like I'm working with students um, and teaching basic clay building techniques or basic cloth forming techniques. Um, in, in working with a group of people that are 
eager and grateful um, to exercise the human right of expression, right? Which is the opportunity to make art. And, um, and not only that, but to also be active members within their cultural communities. Uh, so the shapes of these artworks are always very mesmerizing in the exhibition spaces and they have a very strong collective presence, but I will say that um, indispensably the, the success of the work truly is more um, based on the more social structural shapes and forms that result at the end of a project. What um, or any given community project, right? And I'm talking about shapes like, you know, the formation and acknowledgement um, of inclusion of immigrant communities in a museum exhibit, the shaping of new relationships and opportunities for immigrant communities, um, the forming of new artists in the community, um, shaping new histories and uh, creating new scholarship opportunities through the collections and acquisitions of this kind of work, um, shaping new, more inclusive futures, really. And those are the most important shapes and forms that I consider as part of my work. Thank you. And something that, you know, is, is so really striking about your work is the way that it engages with the U.S.-Mexico border, especially as a site where healing is possible. Um, I'd love to know about the way that you approach this as an embodied practice, whether through sound, working with embroidery, and materials like repurposed Border Patrol uniforms. Yes, thank you for that question. And yeah, for example, in, in the Space in Between project, maybe we can move to the next slide. Um, that that is an installation um, where you you know at the center stage is the space in between project and the pepita para el oro para que hable o calle and um, you know the space in between work and and the birds and the parrots are in the gallery are meant to be a very haptic experience for the viewer. So the public has uh, an understanding of the work through their own bodily um, sensory, right? Um, throughout the work, there's uh, symbols of the work that are very, very strong and they represent bodies, right? So you have the geographical body, you have the cactus body, you have the uprooted immigrant body, you have the border patrol officer, uh, represented as a body, and then you have the, the collective body, right, of all the works and the people represented. Um, but beyond the symbolic... Um, Pero más allá de los... Below, excuse me? Beyond the symbolic um, symbol of the mean of the body, um, it, the body also functions as a tool to create healing through self-awareness, through um, a mindfulness, through acceptance. Um, the body creates a sense of belonging and self-responsibility. Um, and in this work, it's important to pay attention to the main uh, material that's being transformed here, and that's the Border Patrol uniform which to some in America society, um, the material represents safety, security, control, power, but to others it represents something totally different, such as uprootedness, violence, um, family separation, and even death. Um, and the idea here is to bring these opposing communities with different perspectives um, to enter into a um, common dialogue and work together to deconstruct and transform uh, this uniform material into shapes that represent new bodies, right? Um, shapes that represent growth, that represent flourishment, that represent nature and life. Um, so there is a, a kind of embodiment um, in the physical qualities of the work they are also visible through the manual labor of its making. Uh, and it's very important to the work's significance. For example, there are very anthropomorphic soft sculptures that seem to be losing structure. Um, they are presented like 
you know, strings like hair, and there are forms that are made up of exhausted, cut up shapes, for instance. Um, there's also uh, like a, to share a poignant and embodied moment in, in this process. Um, it's a moment when a participant um, who has been uprooted transforms a uniform and fabric that represents the body of an oppressor and makes art with it. It's a very healing moment of justice. Another example of embodiment in the gallery, I would say, are the Pepita para el Loro parrots that are um, the robotic, um, they represent the robotic responses um, within the space. So the parrots are Pepita para el Loro, para que hables o calle means a nugget for the bird to speak or be quiet. Um, and basically are, they are birds and they complement the experience of the space in between project uh, pieces and engage the viewer, um, you know, more actively. Uh, the parrots are meant to represent Mexican parrots that are at risk uh, of extinction due to their trade in, in the pet industry. Um, and they're sewn by, by hand and they have a inside of them a mimicry device that engages the audience responses. So if you speak to the bird in the gallery, that bird will echo back what you say and will um, in, transmit the word that you, or the, the phrase that you share throughout the gallery space. Um, and so, you know, there's this kind of chaotic, robotic, mechanical dialogue that's taking place, um, which, you know, it, there's humor and there's this kind of playfulness in the work that's meant to be um, very critical of, um, of our community's complacency to, to the dehumanizing of the US government towards our immigrant communities. Um, and so this kind of like chaos, right? This robotic uh, and chaos is reflective of this uh, complacency, but also of the media um, using a misinformation as truth for political gain, for instance. Um, and so the work is very politicized uh, within the gallery and it's, it offers a contemplation for diverse audiences to interpret um, you know, these issues um, and these spaces from a different place of wisdom and a different place of knowledge, right? Through a more diverse perspective. Um, and um, this, you know, the, the work is, has long-term impact on the community um, participating and those who are supporting this kind of work. Um, so when people are confronted with these pieces, they, they um, public for instance, becomes a testament to the extraordinary strength and the resilience and the survival of immigrant communities. Um, and this testament in turn then creates uh, empathy, right? It inspires kindness, which we know has tremendous positive impacts on our body's immunities and cardiovascular health actually. Um, and so not only do the people involved in the act of giving and receiving kindness uh, benefit, but also those that are observing, right? So these act of kindness um, encourage people to repeat good deeds, right? So it's amazing how um, our bodies can resonate and heal, you know, with creative kindness. And I think this is an example of that. Absolutely. And in our last couple of moments together, I'd, I'd love to talk about how your work and, and a persistent through line in it is an emphasis on dialogue. Um, and specifically, you know, how we often assume that dialogue takes place within a community, but that you, you demonstrate this capacity to be in dialogue with the landscape as well. And um, I'm curious to hear what it means in your practice to be in dialogue with the landscape, especially in light of histories of extractive practices of the landscape um, that humans have, have committed. Yes, yes. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I will say that whether the work represents the land or um, land is, is used to create the artwork, 
Uh, the artistic dialogue really is about the memory of the land and the healing qualities and transformative qualities that it embodies. Um, for example, in the next slide, uh, if you could turn to that, the Longmont Community Project, um, which is you know center stage on the images there, um, is, is a community project which centers on art and issues of food accessibility. And um, it's a project that um, was sponsored by uh, the BMOCA Museum, Longmont Museum of Art. It's an exhibition, Agriculture, which invited farmers and artists to collaborate and inspire um, the, thought, the thinking of more uh, ethical relationship to food and a relationship to land and each other. Um, and I was paired up with the Olin Farms from Boulder, Colorado. And um, the project was inspired by the parable of the long spoons, which is um, I'll quickly tell you the story um, about pe people sitting around a table with a pot of hearty stew, warm food, each with very long spoons. And although they have a spoon to reach the food in the middle of the table with their, their long uh, spoon, they, the length makes it impossible for them to reach the food to their own mouths and therefore they're starving. So until they realize that the spoon can reach the person across the table and they can then feed each other, then you know they're all saved. Um, and they go to heaven. This is an old Jewish story. But the message is nourishing others is a way of nourishing ourselves, right? Which pairs up beautifully with the values and the spirit of the Olin Farms. Um, the, the thinking about um, work in dialogue with the land. Um, I also want to share the farm experience paired up with the Nordic experience was an incredible. Uh, the Olin Farms taught us the understanding of our land and the care for it, um, learning about regen regeneration of agriculture and increasing diversity and health of ecosystems. Uh, most importantly, we learned that um, the soil, the land, the soil determines the health of everything that grows out of it, including food and including communities, right? So um, the experience, you know, working with the farm was not only um, educational, but undoubtedly is going to transform the way in which all of us who came in contact with the work uh, relate to the land and the world around us, right? It's a very spiritual communal experience. Um, and all of this led to the creation of the spoons, which you see in the main slide and you see the workshop images on the right. Um, and you can see that um, the installation looks amazing with these incredible sculptures that depict uh, community stories. Everything is handmade with community participation uh, and sharing of stories that relate to, to the land, right? But I just wanna mention um, quickly that the most impar important part of the CARE project um, is to come in the future. And that is a community feast dialogue where folks uh, around the Long Longmont community who are working to advance uh, food accessibility, they will be invited to a performance and a feast where guests will feed each other while participating in a conversation that centers on the specific themes related to food accessibility, right? Like food, soil regeneration again, um, like food deserts, extractivist uh, farming and environmental racism and, and more. And I have other stories to share, but I, I know we don't have uh, much more time. So I can stop there with this, this slide. Thank you so Thank much, Margarita. And what a what a poignant note to end on in anticipation of the next phase of this project. At this time, it's a pleasure to invite Beatriz Cortez to join me on the virtual stage. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Beatriz, it's a pleasure to be in conversation. And in thinking about your work, I was really struck by the fact that it offers this generative invitation to shift away from an anthropocentric construction of time and to foreground nonlinear temporalities and expansive timescales, such as those of the earth and geological formations. I'd like to ask you 
how do you approach this expansive notion of time and the absences that are inherent to it in order to create a work that has a tangible presence and a sense of immediacy? Thank you, Mary. Um, I, I want to begin by saying that it's a pleasure to be here and to share this space with um, these artists that I admire so much, Margarita and Post Commodity, Kayden, also uh, Cristobal. And I am um, so glad to be in this conversation with you and with Marcela and with Michelle. So thank you so much. Um, well, to to answer your question, I think that slowly time became a central element in my work, and I um, I think it changed everything because I began to see each image and each object as time travelers and um, as containers of multiple um, temporalities and of moments that happen without humans being present and um, for things to exist, not for humans. And that became so beautiful. And so to think of the of these multiple temporalities also dismantles the logic of modernity and the logic of borders and art um, and I love that. I love that the sculptures then exist and take a place within the art world. And at the same time, they speak of other temporalities beyond our own and enter other spaces that are future, that are, haven't happened and in some way will futures to happen, um, speak of our desire. Um, like Margarita was saying, our desire for generosity um as a way to construct futures etc fantastic and um i was curious could you share a little about the 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 piece that we're looking at in in the slide yes this is ilopango the volcano that left at storm king art center in new york by the hudson and um it was it, inspired by a volcanic eruption that happened in what is now El Salvador. But before El Salvador existed, El Salvador, like the United States, has it's only 200 years old, you know? So many things have happened in the world and in the universe before our countries even began to exist. And at, at, in that place of the earth, at the center of the earth, where now we see the tropics flourishing, there was a volcanic eruption that was massive and that um, impacted the whole world and darkened the sun for about 18 months and that spread particles from the underworld which became a symbol of birth and um, part of the story of creation for many of the indigenous communities that emerged in Mesoamerica and what we call Mesoamerica and so the underworld then as a symbol of what's under the earth which calls our attention to the underground rivers that flow, the lava that flows between where I am in Los Angeles right now and that and that land, et cetera. All these particles went flying in the atmosphere and took a long time to land. When they darkened the sun that year, there was no summer, it was all winter. Many people died because the crops didn't make it, et cetera. But at the same time, those particles spread the land, the land, the particles of the underworld everywhere. And so to me, the first thing that struck me about this story, which I, I came back to it during the pandemic because um, there was a, a, a scholar who found particles of this volcano in Iceland and was able to demonstrate that the volcanic eruption had taken these particles to Antarctica and to the Arctic and all over the planet. And I began to think how immigrants as they're crossing the border are standing on their own land, no matter where they are. And that was a um, super beautiful way to look at the landscape um, as part of other temporalities. And so this volcano, this um, sculpture, which is also itself a traveler was, made in France and then in my studio in Los Angeles and at Storm King is going to also travel over the Hudson River to the MPAC, which is at the Resolier Polytechnic Institute. And it's going to um, 
travel over a boat on the Hudson in this symbolic gesture that continues um, invoking the movement of land and the movement of the landscape and the transformation of the planet in temporalities that we are unable to detect with our short lifespan. And so then it's going to be installed um, inside the concert hall at the impact and it will take another life and speak about the sound that objects emanate and carry with, it, with, um, with them as memories of their own different temporalities and transformations. Thank you so much for sharing sharing that. And something that I think is really resonant in in this piece is is that there's a rethinking of notions of permanence. And you know, your work addresses the movements of cultural objects, of natural materials, of people across time and space. And and as you said, there's there's a transformation that takes place. And I'd love to know more about how how the traces of that those migrations and transformations are inscribed in in other projects you've you've um, done as well. Thank you for that question, Mary. I think um, that has been really important in my work. But I think when installing one time, I was installing my work at in Marfa at Ballroom Marfa. And I remember that um, I saw the idea of permanence in the art world there, which also exists at Storm King, the idea that, for example, Judd's works were installed in a certain way, thinking about the light, et cetera. And I, I was struck by the idea that Judd believed in the, in the permanence of the light being hitting always this landscape in the same way over the years. And, and I thought a lot about that optimism, you know, and I thought a lot about the fact that at that time when Judd was installing those works, uh, Marfa was probably not yet or not in this way, in the symbolic way, one of the headquarters of the Border Patrol. But, um, you know, for me installing those works that I was installing in conversation with Chamberlain, with Judd, with the Border Patrol, with the Chinati Foundation, with the border itself, um, was important in terms of thinking about impermanence as movement, as a way of always being on the go, as always becoming. And, um, and when I installed this volcano at Storm King, that question came back to, to my mind. And I think it um, has become really important because I'm trying to desire, I'm trying to not desire permanence as my goal in life, I'm trying to not desire permanence for a monument or for a sculpture. I'm trying to desire becoming transformation, movement, um, and to engage in the experiences and conversations that that movement also brings to the lives that we live as human beings, but also that the planet lives and that the animals and um, the plants experience as well as migrants um, that they are. Thank you so much. That, and, you know, I, I'd love if we could look at uh, an additional image showing the, the way that, you know, we see this transcription inscribed on, on another work of yours. Um, and yes, I, please. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Mary. Oh well, I was I was going to to shift to to ask about how how you're thinking about reinscribing the landscape through through materials, but um, you know before before we closed with that question, if um, if you wanted to share anything about this piece, you know please please feel you know I think we'd all love to hear about it. Yeah, no, I wanted to say that this piece uh, Stella Z, which is a piece made after Kiriwa, meaning that after one of the Stellas. Um, that were found in the site of Kiriwan that were made by the ancient Maya. Um, Contrary Warrior is a work that speaks about temporalities and also it's an effort to make a critique of um, linearity of chronologies because they are Darwinian and because they um, represent in that narrative of Darwinian chronologies Indigenous peoples are always placed in the back as if they were part of the past and not part of the future. And, um, you know, like the Zapatista said, we want to imagine a world that, that's 
where there's room for everybody. And that's part of the effort. And so in this stella, there's an inscription of temporalities of the travels of the sculpture that's next to it and of the sculpture itself that we're looking at. And in this narrative of the temporalities, which you can see in some of the details here, um, there's the movement of the, there's the eruption of the volcano and the movement of the sculpture over a shipping container crossing the Atlantic, arriving to the port of Los Angeles, where there's all these shipping containers and a bridge, and then getting to my studio, where there's um, the, our gate, which says Building 5, um, and then being installed at, at Storm King. And so when I made this sculpture, um, all, the, all the things that are happening there had not happened yet, and now, it is already installed at Storm King. So half of the Stella has moved from the future towards the past, but the other half hasn't happened yet. The travels of the, of the volcano over the Hudson River and its arrival to the impact, as well as the last part of the Stella, which has not been inscribed yet in an effort to evoke the idea that the future is open. And so this piece then, um, you know, it's a reference to how we can also imagine temporalities in abstract ways, and we can insert our hands into uh, narrating the past again in other ways, and narrating the future and um, thinking of the movement of time in different directions in multiplicities, etc. So that's what this work is about. But with regards to the next slide, um, that work is at my solo show at the Williams College Museum of Art, which is um, up right now. And uh, our opening celebration will take place next week on September 21st. This war, this um, show is called The Portals and it's, uh, it engages with the histories um, of the Williams College as a symbol of our, hist our national histories and our histories with education, with access to education a conversation about um, the many people that fight for justice in a space in different temporalities, even if some of the exclusions continue to exist, et cetera. And um, when I visited Williams College and I was planning to make uh, this exhibition, there, were, there was an initiative by the Stockbridge Muncie community, but also by the students that um, said these are Mohican homelands. There were banners everywhere. Different houses had their picket sign, you know, and um, it was beautiful to me. And I had heard that the regulations at Williams College only allow banners to be up for one week. And so I decided to invite the Stockbridge Muncie community to amplify their message in those flyers. Um, through my my work, which um, has uh, actually was going to be installed for nine months, but it's going to be there for 12 months. And so um, this message, which was a collaboration with the Stockbridge Muncie Community Language Program, and I'm very grateful to them and also to Lisa Doring, who um, the curator of the of the exhibition, who um, has been also in contact with them, and um, they recorded the the language, the Mohican language, this um, phrase which says, "This we are standing on Mohican homelands," and I would like to play it for you all. Kapam fitnama ekenik. It's also a celebration of the survival of the language, of the ways in which indigenous peoples mark the land in non-permanent ways, in ways that celebrate impermanence because celebrate movement. And survival is about movement. And um, the Stockbridge Monsey communities um, were displaced from where Williams College is. Most of them are in Delaware and in other locations. But um, you know they continue to survive as they have moved to other locations and also in this place where the voids that they left are still visible. And so this piece is about that, about the void of the Stockbridge Muncie community in this landscape, but also about their presence and about the ways in which this land is unceded territory. Thank you so much. Beatrice, what a powerful note uh, to end 
this the segment of our program on and thank you so much for for sharing so generously about your work mm -hmm. at this time i would love to turn the floor over to marcella who will be in conversation with post commodity thank you so much mary and i would love to invite um kate and cristobal to turn on their camera perfect i see them both hi i'm, I'm sure you're all thinking about all these beautiful connections that exist um, between uh, all the works and and I'm so happy to be in conversation with you and, and eventually dig and delve into these um, points of contact between all the works. But I wanted to start with commodity and 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 to offer this thinking that uh, you know that that comes to mind whenever I think about your work and is this beautiful shift in perspective um, that I see happening from colonial violence that we may experience on a daily basis to a different type of epistemology that's ideated on ancestral and indigenous knowledge. And, you know, I think when that one of those ideas or, or the way in which we see this shift happening from colonial violence to another type of epistemology, I see it happening in a work like um, Kinai Picoillas, maybe I'm putting some Spanish phonetics in that pronunciation. Um, but I see here a notion, a, a sense of healing, right? And I see that, you know, when we talk about healing, it's usually in contrast to a harm, something that causes harm. And I think it's important to also name that harm. So I wanted to ask you, how do you see these two concepts playing in, in a work like this one? Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcela. Just very briefly, I want to um, to um, uh, acknowledge our, our fellow artists on behalf of Post Commodity, Commodity Beatriz Cortez and Margarita Cabrera. Um, it's a real honor to share this stage with you all. And thank you, Whitney. And thank you, US Latinx Forum. Um, you know, the thing that is really important, and, and we look at this, this piece, um, which is Kinai Picoias, which is a Cree word for uh, the translation in English is snake meat. And um, this uh, title was provided by curator Gerald McMaster. This, this, this work is part of uh, Post Commodities 2021 solo exhibition at the uh, Ramey Modern Museum in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan on Cree territory. And so, um, well, you know, to answer your question, while we we acknowledge that there's harm, um, we we also use this reality as a collective to encourage or propose thought leadership, even despite challenging realities. And so, you know, I think a core proposition as post commodity is to make a mark of ascent which is in active contrast to positioning ourselves as broken or damaged. And I, I think that this work really illustrates that intention. Um, this work is um, comprised of four 100 foot industrial boom uh, debris booms. And these, these booms are used to corral like oil, like when there's an oil spill. Um, they're also used to um, to uh, collect garbage and, and other chemicals. And one of the things that is really important is that the colors of these booms correspond to different types of threats that are uh, uh, in relation to relationship or what, what is referred to as uh, hazmat or hazardous ma materials. So we have red that is flammable, yellow that is radioactive, blue representing dangerous and quite poisonous. And then to the same point, while we have this sort of discourse of, of danger, of, of uh, threat to indigenous peoples throughout the Americas, these are our shared medicine colors and that they carry knowledge, purpose, and meaning throughout our hemisphere. And they connect us. And the reason why this comes together with the idea of snake meat is that these booms are, are hung to, to, to represent this, that the Americas has been chopped into four parts. 
and that each part represents an area of the colonial map of the Western Hemisphere. So we have South America and Central America and North America and all of the surrounding islands. And so what, what we really want to communicate and, and, and to, to wrap up the answer to your really important question is that even though like our hemisphere is represented today in this meet in this in this manner as this these four pieces of of meat we we still see that you know there's still a power there and and the the reason why we're we're looking at the snake as an idea is that uh, both Kate and I me coming from a Mexican American background and and uh and uh uh New Mexico indigenous background with Henisaro and Pueblo people and Cade being a, a an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation we we share this um this the idea of this beast this this large um a snake in Cherokee is referred to as uctena and in um and in um uh, uh, Mexican cultures and Chicano culture, it's Quetzalcoatl. And we we are all riding together on the backs of this mythological beast. We're all communicating on the backs of this beast. And, and our message is that if we could just get over these borders, we in post-commodity believe that there's a shared power in Native American and Latin American indigenous peoples, that there's a shared power that we can experience by overcoming the genesis amnesias that have largely been instated by borders and in the ways that borders have in many ways caused us to forget our relationships, our trade relationships, our, 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 our relations. And so um, I, I think that um Kate and I are very much believe that and argue that the world might very well need such relationships for its survival. Thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent question, Marcela. Kate, okay. okay, was there anything you want to add? No, I think that was comprehensive and absolutely beautiful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I agree. Um so, Kate, maybe if we can move to the next slide. Um, this one, Dreams, Blessings, and Memory. This is a work that addresses destructive labor practices within the military agricultural complex. And, you know, as a curator, especially in a museum of American art, um, I try to be hyper aware of the ways museums can perpetrate further violences. And this work, I love it because it bears a specificity of the cost of farm workers in the San Joaquin Valley, but in its making, you turn the museum into a ceremonial site while going against the desire for visibility that museums rely on. In other words, there's so much about the making um, of the work that is not in its, it's not necessarily visible. So there's a kind of a defiant act in, in doing that. So, can you speak about the work, the, it's making all the layers basically that are part of this work? I'll, <clears throat> I'll try to work my way backwards uh, a little bit and just start immediately with the ceremonial aspect of the work um, that involves the museum uh, staff and their labor and their time. Um, as the, the staff, um, uh fixes um the material um which is charcoal uh to the wall um using a stenciling process they have to record themselves on video and audio um praying and singing uh prayers that acknowledge our interconnectedness and uh venerate uh the land and specifically pray for the UNESCO sites that we share between us, because that's often the demarcation internationally um, of 
our existence as people, uh, as indigenous people. So um, it's a it's an opportunity to where the we can use ceremony as it's intended to be used. Ceremony is a pedagogical endeavor. And we bring that into the museum as a pedagogical endeavor for the institution, um, because it is institution resources that are being committed to this process. And oftentimes the curators are involved, board members are involved. So it, it's, a, it's a process that goes much deeper than just us and one of the preps that is working on this. This is a group effort. So it's that shared experience. But the piece itself, which the translation into, into English is crop duster rising and falling, dropping chemical rainbows onto carrot fields and Indian guide, flagging the craft, the aircraft for one more turn. So the substance of the poem is based, it's actually my father's story and my father's Cherokee and, you know, we're Oklahoma Indians. We're originally from Southeast to Georgia, Tennessee and so forth. But, you know, he came from Oklahoma to California and he was uh, working the fields um, like a lot of Oklahoma Indians would do is migrate every year, work the fields. This was really common from the 20s to the 70s um, and even to today. But uh, he was flagging um, the crop duster and he was poisoned and had to spend a few months in the hospital as a result. And he's lived the rest of his life with the health care, with the health consequences of that experience. But the reason why I chose that reason, I'm so sorry, the reason why we chose that story as something to develop into a piece, because that's a story we shared with each other. We share stories all the time, but how it becomes a post-commodity work is the positioning of it. The fact that this is something that is a shared history, not just with Cherokee people, but also indigenous people from south of the border. And this is in Nahuatl, uh, the language here. And that's the, you know, there are over 2 million uh, indigenous people speaking this language. This is the most broadly spoken indigenous language in our hemisphere. And, um, you hear this language in the fields in the San Joaquin Valley. And I wanted to honor that experience and to share and highlight that in a way that would be as relevant and, um, and powerful as possible. Um, so while it was an experience that happened to my father, it's an experience that has happened to thousands of indigenous people working in the fields. So uh, that's a real important uh, aspect of, of the piece itself. Thank you, Caden. Can we play the, the recording so that we listen to a beautiful um, yeah, poem? Try again. La pastilla de momia quilia tlenguetzi, que más casti tlenashquali tlencose malot. Panmili capa onca zanahorias guani me cayo más iguali, que isnes cayo tía de postotot y caseyuk cawi. Thank you for playing that. And I just want to harken back to something Cristobal said about we are on the backs, we are all on the backs of this uh, Uctena, um, and we're we're on the backs together also in in the farm in the farms of, of you know the Central Valley, and um, it's just one very specific example that's very personal to us. It's a part of our our history, our lived history, that we wanted to share in a way to a broader public. Thank you, Kate. And, and yeah, I think you crystallize a way in the ways in which 
you know, there's no maybe institution that's gonna recognize, acknowledge, celebrate the points of contact links uh, in a hemispheric indigeneity or global indigeneity, but you do it through this work. And, and that's the power of ceremony that you so beautifully named. Um, and it, so we have one more slide and, and I love that this will be the, the, the last slide before we open it to you know the conversation between all of you. Um, and here I wanted to invite specifically Cristobal to talk about the work because when I see it, I think of expansiveness, not in a manifest destiny way, I wanna clarify, <laughs> but something that surpasses its own container, meaning, meaning the, the architecture of Reme of the museum is, 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 is almost around it, not, not that the sculpture was placed there. It's more like, it looks like the architecture is happening around it. And so, you know, scale also comes to mind. And, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about this, of, of what are the, you know, what, what's the thinking that informs your choice of form, scale and materials? Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcela. I feel like your question was also a very beautiful read of the work. Um, but uh, very, very quickly, and I know that we're we're very close on time now, I just want to acknowledge Delfina de la Cruz de la Cruz and Ofelia Cruz Morales, who are, were our collaborators in the previous work that we looked at. They, they are two indigenous Nahuatl speakers from Oaxaca in Mexico. And that was a real honor to get to work with them, a really true, truly sacred honor for us to get to work with them on that work. Um, this piece called South by North is also North by South. It, it also reflects back to the snake meat piece that we looked at earlier. Again, here we have, um, uh, hazmat colors and indigenous medicine colors. And one of the things we want to do is we wanted to hearken back to our shared indigenous structures. And a lot of times when we think about pyramids, we're thinking about what is currently referred to as Mesoamerica, but pyramid, pyramids and pyramidal mounds existed throughout all of the, the Americas and, and in North America as well. And that's not something that we we often acknowledge or that the public at large is even aware of. And uh, we see that these common forms uh, of expression um, they represent the migration of knowledge. And I really love like Beatrice, like the migration of land. And there's a migration of knowledge as well. And and so. Um, uh, just to, to wrap this up, these, these uh, barrels, which are containment barrels for hazmat, hazardous waste, have been arranged in a way to reflect beating patterns that exist throughout our hemispheres. Um, but, but they're also, um, um, it's the idea of thinking about the institution and its, its sort of colonial practice, which is like to contain to contain knowledge, to represent knowledge. And that, that is in relationship to the metaphor of like containment of hazardous materials. And, and when we look at the, the like industry, we can see that industry has failed to contain hazardous materials. We're, we're seeing the ongoing pollution of our natural water supply. It's really threatening. Our, our way of life among many other ecological challenges we face. But at the same time that we we're dealing with this spillage, the, the, museum is our, the museums are having to con contend with their own uh, um, lack of or failure to, to contain, which was very much a part of the colonial project. The idea that indigenous knowledges can circulate within and proliferate an institution, but they cannot be contained by an institution. They, they, they exist before, they're always becoming in the past, in the present, in the, in the future. And that determination of always becoming is not contingent on a museum. And so here with this sculpture, you see the pyramid as if extending beyond the, the ceiling of the museum, extending beyond the floor and extending beyond the walls. And this uh, work, 
is um, like like the previous slide is also referring to my father who was also poisoned by industry. Um, in, in my case, my father was exposed to nuclear fissile material and other toxins uh, working at Los Alamos National Laboratory and unfortunately uh, passed away several years back due to um, uh, his uh, a little over 10 years battle with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So we, we really wanted to tell the story of our fathers being poisoned and, and to look at that and to look at these, these, this uh, uh, metaphor of the hemisphere, like the, the idea that is, there's an irreconcilable ten, tension or, or narrative conflict, um, these dual meanings, one harmful, one healing. And that to us is an act to act as a conflict, a complex and conflicting metaphor of the Americas. And I think that's certainly something that is worth meditating and reflecting on, because it's certainly something we I believe we're going to we're going to have to overcome. And we and Kate have had many conversations around this idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you both for sharing those stories about your, your fathers. And I think it, it, in a planning meeting that we had, you mentioned like, sure, there's grieving that can happen, but in a very true post-commodity fashion of having these stories be a mark of ascent, you're using the stories of your fathers to, you know, put them in a museum, present them, and really uh, branch out from those specific stories to, um, Things that might connect us, farm workers, um, you know, to people working uh, on the border, and also the hemispheric connections that we see here. Oh, that's so. And important. now I. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Marcela. Thank you. Uh, I would love to invite Beatrice and Margarita and um, and Mary, and um, we have about twenty minutes left. Um, so if this is your time, so. We might, we could put another question to the group, but if you guys feel and want to talk. <laughs> uh, I, think we, I think we need like an icebreaker. Margarita. Well, I can say something to you, um, your comments, uh, Cristobal, um, you know, and the work that you're both doing is so, um, compelling and so moving and it just made me think about um, how you know we're working towards this healing and um, you know with our projects and with our work and I, I might we're always coming across these moments of oppression and and you know the way that I somehow find to be able to move forward and continue to work against you know, the systematic um, in oppressions that exist and acts of violence is that whenever there is an act of oppression, it's always an opportunity for a positive transformation. And, um, and it just, you know, you inspired me to think about that uh, with all the comments that you, you were sharing. Um, but I, I also want to just go ahead and say that I, um, I had a question for, for both of you. Um, and I know that we both work at ASU, of course, and uh, and I understand this is the second time that we're presenting together. So I'm really honored um, as well with Beatriz. Um, but, um, you know, I'll say that teaching, I believe is like art, right? And that we are creating this intentional dialogue and working from a place of vulnerability when we're teaching. And I just wanna say that I always find that to be really, really moving when, when I see you working at the university um, uh, platform um, and you work with a lot of kindness and respect and it's very awesome to see that. Um, but in, for both of you, um, I want to ask about collaboration, uh, both uh, you and Clay. Um, for me, collaboration is between supporting organizations, 
uh, immigrant communities, academic communities, nonprofits, churches, civic organizations, consulates, et cetera, et cetera. So many people that I work with to make my works. Um, with your collective, when there's two of you leading the way through many important decisions, um, can you share a little bit about the collective approach that you have found to work best so far for you? Absolutely. Um, you know, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to to um, hand the stage over to my collaborator, Kate, in honor of, of, of Kate um, being the co-founder of Post Commodity and, and really came to, to me and uh, he founded the, the collective in 2007 and came to me along with our uh, our collaborators at that time um, with an invitation, and 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 the the invitation was um, was uh, came with a, a very um, beautiful uh, mission and set of intentions that that I would then uh, um, accept and work very hard to honor, support, and extend throughout the years, and and I like. I, I love listening to, to to Kate speak on this, and then I, I will add I will add to some of what he has to say. And thank you, Margarita. You know, uh, the collaborating in in this collective environment is was really about creating a, a learning community and to build power around ideas and to to take on projects that perhaps are a little bit more complicated or uh, a little bit more challenging than what any of us as individuals could do. So it was the idea that let's come together and make something that's greater than the sum of the individual parts. That that was really, really important. So from, the, from day one, um, when we work, we work together on every facet of the project from the inception to revision, to research, to design, to production, to exhibition, it's, it's always been a all hands on deck in endeavor. And it's an endeavor that it's coming out of Phoenix and Phoenix is a lot like, you could say it's, it's, it's a brown power center in the United States, very similar to how Atlanta is uh, for black people. Um, and in Phoenix, there's this tradition that was established by Chicken Indio, a collective uh, that was uh, indigenous and Chicano artists uh, working and collaborating together and providing a supportive infrastructure to build their practices uh, from. And we wanted to bring that tradition into our work. That was something that was really important to, to post community as a collective. So we're very much a part of what Phoenix is and, and the traditions of, of that art community, uh, for sure. And, you know, one thing that I would really want to offer, um, offer uh, everyone about collaboration and something that I'm, I'm so proud of, and uh, there is a lot of uh, this sort of presence of labor, right, that I think in many ways um, cuts across uh, the works that we're showing here. And um, one of the things we we learned very early on as a collective is that one of a, a, a driver, we, we really had to bring in a pissed, like an indigenous way of being and knowing and, and really model that in practice. We recognize that this sort of capitalist concepts of labor could really drive a wedge between all of us um, in, in the collective. So we sought to, um, I'd say in phase one, see ourselves as an interdisciplinary collective and then move ourselves into a transdisciplinary collective. So we didn't wanna have any like divisions of labor happen within the collective that were based on individuals embodiments of various types of expertise. Because what that would mean is like, if you have one artist who is really good at digital media and another uh, another artist that's really good at poetry, that, that, that those 
those knowledges can can be held in um, politically within a collective in or and they could create asymmetries of power so going back to what Kate was saying we structured ourselves as a learning community and we use every single work of art as an opportunity to teach each other our the skill sets we bring to the table moving into a more transdisciplinary approach so we really embody as individuals coming together as a collective we really embody a shared knowledge and we are always teaching each other and growing from that. And so we never instrumentalize each other to make a work of art. We use a work of art as an opportunity from which to build and strengthen our relationships with each other. And I think that is a real like, key to, to our success as, as a collective. And, um, and we, we're very proud because aspirationally, we don't always achieve it, but we work very hard to try to always um, honor uh, the four R's, which you find in uh, American Indian and Native American um, studies, which are respect, reciprocity, relationships, and responsibility. And we always try to radiate out from that center of, of these four R's. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I, piggy, I want to piggyback on what you said, um, because I've heard, Beatriz, I've heard you speak um, about kind of, a, and correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of an anti-disciplinarity. And, and we see it materially happening, and even in the works of the other artists, of um, like Margarita, when you see the threads, you know, we, you see these very soft sculptures, like, you know, they're not supposed to be that, right? They're supposed to be rigid, but Beatriz, specifically in your work, the, and um, which you spoke about this with Eric Booker on a talk um, uh, for Storm King. Um, so shout out to him. Um, but the, um, when you're welding, you know, you're not sanding down the, the, the themes, right? You're letting, you know, you, you, and, and that people have told you, oh, this is not how it's supposed to be done. So there's something about an anti-disciplinarity that's very productive. Um, and that in that uh, um, unsuturing or unstitching or letting the themes uh, be, you know, you can see them, there is a suturing perhaps of, of histories of temporalities. So I don't know if that makes any sense. Sense, yeah. but anything that you want to see. No, it's really important. I think that I, I want to um, kind of say in this conversation, say that most sculptures are monumental and they don't exist as monumental sculptures in the same way that other monumental sculptures exist. They were made um, by, by the collaboration and through the collaboration and the empowerment of many peoples. Um, in particular, of course, the artists that work with me by my side in my studio, uh, Tatiana Guerrero, Philip Byrne, and Ricardo Rutia, but also the ancient knowledge that is embedded into it, the um, way in which we uh, honor the labor of immigrants and the way in which we honor how immigrants teach we teach ourselves how to do things that we don't know how to do because we need jobs when we don't have other opportunities, um, et cetera. And so I think all those things are embedded. The labor is embedded into the work. And it's an effort therefore to remove these materials, steel or the plants or all the objects that we're um, inserting into a sculpture from industrialization, outside of industrialization to other temporalities and back to being organic and back to the earth. And um, we do that through labor, through the labor of many, many others, but also by learning how ancient peoples did things and by learning how abstract thought has happened throughout um, centuries, and how it has been generated by indigenous communities, even if we are taught in school that that abstraction comes from, you know, modernity, et cetera. And so I think that in many ways, these time travels and these 
messages that are carried by a sculpture also are inscribed on, on the surfaces by the labor of many. Um, but I, and so I wanted to say that and say thank you to them. They're here um, with me in the, in the, in this space. And I think that also I, I um, when, when we say that um, a sculpture can carry the messages of many others is because I, I have had, I've been fortunate to have so many teachers, my community here, my, my immigrant community in Los Angeles, but also um, many teachers in Central America, for example, I have collaborated for over 15 years with a Kachikel, Maya Kachikel Collective called Kajai. Um, and together we have um, carried out many projects and written many things and thought together many things. And so all that knowledge is there. And I think it's beautiful because it has taught me to imagine disciplines as nationalism and other uh, uh, identities as things that can function in ways that just trap you into thinking or operating in a very specific way and trying to get rid of that um, imposition is really important to me. So I try to stay away from nationalisms and try to imagine other temporalities instead. And I understand the importance of the visibility of identities, but I try to say, um, you know, imagine what they were in other times, et cetera. And I think that's really important. And that's also part of the sculpture's um, collectivity. And so I, I'm really interested in that. But I wanted to throw in um, also a comment about the three presentations that it was really beautiful to see the, the three presentations, how in spite of the difficult moment that um, this country is experiencing, in spite of the ways in which immigrants are still today being divided, the families are being divided, the borders um, still there, um, you know, people are unable to reunite their families. There is no path to legalization for many immigrant communities, including um, specifically Salvadoran, Guatemalan, and Mexican Im immigrants today. Um, how positive and full of generosity our approach to the border and to migration is. And um, that has been really beautiful to see um, this idea of feeding each other, this idea of um, welcoming each other, empowering uh, others through our work, et cetera, that we, that we have heard today. It's, it's really beautiful to think about how out of the darkness comes all this generosity. I don't know if the others would like to say a few words about that, but um, I would love to hear Margarita and you guys from Post Commodity um, say that something about generosity because it's so such an important presence to give a forum, open a space for others to speak through your work, et cetera. Yes, I mean, I um, thank you for asking and mentioning the, the, the act of, you know, generosity. I think I also, with you, um, feel very grateful to all the people that, um, that I, I've worked with. Um, and I, you know, I really acknowledge my privilege and my place as an art, a working artist, and I try to leverage my my place to, um, you know, support my community and uh, my immigrant communities. And, um, and so I am very, very grateful for, you know, the invisibility of, or, you know, because if we're talking about thousands of people that have been involved in the work that um, I've been a part of. And um, yeah, it goes without saying that it is an incredible, um, act, you know, to gift their time, their energy, their stories to to these projects. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, in the projects that that I've been involved with, there's always a conversation about what we're trying to do collectively and how um, the collective creative energy, you know, when supported and empowered, can move mountains. You know. 
And even though there's a lot of resistance against that collective voice and that collective power, there's still this um, uh, urge or willingness to work together to try to, you know, take steps forward, right? With the, the acts, the creative acts that we're putting forward as, as communities. Um, even if we don't get as far as we hope, you know, even if we set to accomplish 100%, but only reach 85%, you know, just walking forward with this type of production um, means there's change and means, you know, there's transformation. So um, I'm very honored by the fact that people are trusting of the um, art industry and myself as an artist. Um, when I, you know, we open up these platforms for these uh, works to be possible, um, you know, it's very humbling. And um, there's a lot of growth in that process for everybody involved. Um, a lot of growth in, in on my part too. Um, so I, you know, it goes without saying that I'm more, more than grateful to everybody who's uh, been a part of the works that I've created and it would they wouldn't happen, you know, without their participation. And, you know, from my perspective, generosity is at the core of redistributing power. And that is at the core of our worldview and how so many indigenous communities exist today and yesterday and tomorrow. Um, I feel um, uh, very overwhelmed by by uh, joy, and um, that that joy um, makes me feel like um, I could cry, and. And it does tie to the idea of generosity. Um, I would say that we oftentimes, um, the generosity is is deep in our hearts, um, deep deep in the heart of of post commodity. And I, I would also say it's it's also very much an aspiration. And uh, sometimes we um, we are able to transcend a, a, a great a great deal of um, obstacles and challenges that are very much within ourselves in order to reach greater heights of generosity. And so I, I want to um, thank you, Margarita, for your remarks because some, sometimes you do get like 70% there. Sometimes you get 80%. Sometimes it's like, it really hits. And when it hits, that's when I like go back and I think, wow, okay, that that's that's excellent. And I think that's, it's only really, really hit, like really hit one time in post-commodities uh, career, which is repellent fence, where, where that generosity just, changed our our being where there was an immeasurable experience of or sense of dignity recovered and so um i feel like that's a central tenet of what it means to be a professor uh, and an artist is to demonstrate that demonstrate acts of generosity and even when it's very difficult and painful to do so. Like the pieces that Kate and I showed today were, these are pieces that required sacrifice for industry, you know, so people could eat or that people could power their homes or people could feel a sense of safety while at the same time within the specter of the military industrial complex. And so we we just have to find a way, I feel like it, in generosity to make sure not to close ourselves off because because we feel uh, we may feel a sense of pain, but but to remain open and self-implicate and recognize that the world is like super complicated and 
And I'd love, I love like when I think about, about your work with the cacti, like the border patrol, a lot of people, for example, don't realize that the border patrol is one of the um, employees, like the one of the largest percentages of Latinx people in of all federal agencies. It's, it's, it's largely a brown agency. And if you go and you listen to their stories, it's really complex. And if we're open to each other's stories, we can start to model that, those systems. And it isn't until we model those systems without getting in the way of ourselves that we might be able to actually bring a level of criticality and openness to the things that we maintain and create in our world. And I think that's so important, so important. And I think that's something we as indigenous peoples of the Americas can really offer our hemisphere. Oh, what, what a poignant and, and truly moving note to, to close this conversation on. I know, um, and I think, you know, many of our audience members too will We'll be thinking about this conversation in the coming days, and I, you know, and these themes and and the ideas that you all have brought forward will be resonating, you know, for for a long time to come. And with that, I I want to offer my sincere gratitude to Beatrice, Margarita, and Post Commodity for a stimulating, generative, and generous conversation. We would also like to thank Michelle Ruiz and the team at USLAF. Our deepest gratitude also goes to the person running the show behind the scenes, Andy Hawks, coordinator of public programs, and to Megan Ewer, director of public programs at the Whitney. A big thank you to Colectivo Babia, Cristobal and Pau for their interpretation, and to Christina Jensen for live captioning, and last but not least, thank you Ford Foundation and the Mellon Foundation for supporting the work of Latinx artists and workers. Our next event in the series will be on November 15th in conjunction with the Muse National Museum of Mexican Art. Be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter at uslof.org for updates on how to register. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs>